uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's presentation. Uh, we'll be going to discussing a basic introduction uh, to dynamic light scattering for particle size analysis. It should probably take around 30 minutes. And to uh, take us through this um, presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Schieber, who is a technical support manager. Um, he has a PhD from the Polytechnic of Wales where he studied the physical biochemistry of liposomes using nuclear magnetic resonance techniques. He followed this with a postdoctoral research into liposomal drug delivery at the University of Manchester. Uh, Michael joined us in 1996 as a product technical specialist, and a couple of years later was appointed to his current role, where he's responsible for the product technical specialist and applications groups based in the UK. So with that in mind, I will now hand over and welcome Mike. Thanks, Craig. Welcome, everybody. Um, this talk is called Dynamic Light Scattering in 30 Minutes. It's, it's designed to be uh, a quick, short um, discussion, really, of the technique, how the technique works and so on. So uh, those of you that use more than uh, panalytical products will know that the Zeta Sizer series consists of three instruments. So this talk today is really applicable to all three. Uh, we've got the Nano there, the Micro-V, and the APS. So the basics of the technique are the same uh, for all of these um, instruments. So this is the agenda. It's a very, very short agenda. I'm going to start by discussing uh, Brownian motion. Uh, I'm then going on to talk about correlation, and finally, how we analyze the correlation function. How do we get size information out of the correlation function itself? So let's start with Brownian motion. So dynamic light scattering, and, and I suppose the first thing I should say here is different people know this technique by different names. Uh, we are going to refer to it as dynamic light scattering today. Um, sometimes it's known as photon correlation spectroscopy, and sometimes it's known as quasi-elastic light scattering. Um, so there are three different names for the same technique. And the technique is non-invasive. In other words, we place our sample into a cuvette, uh, we shine a laser into that sample, um, the sample is not influenced at all by that laser, so when we take the sample out of the instrument, it's in exactly the same state as when we've put it in. So it's a non-invasive technique. And it's capable of measuring the size of particles and molecules in suspension. And what we're specifically looking at is Brownian motion. And the important thing about Brownian motion, it's a random movement. Um, so these particles and molecules are moving around randomly because they're constantly being bombarded by the solvent molecules that surround them. And what dynamic light scattering does is to measure the speed at which these particles undergo this Brownian motion. Small particles diffuse rapidly. Uh, large particles diffuse slowly. The velocity of this Brownian motion is called the translational diffusion coefficient. This is given a symbol D. Now, we provide diffusion coefficient information within our software, but the majority of our users would much prefer talking about particle size. So the way in which the diffusion coefficients are converted into size is through the Stokes-Einstein equation that you can see uh, on this slide. So what we end up with um, is a hydrodynamic radius um, we know Boltzmann's constant, we know the temperature at which the measurement is made at, and therefore we know the viscosity of that sample. We know pi, and therefore from this measured diffusion coefficient, we can get our particle size or our hydrodynamic size. What do we mean by hydrodynamic size? It's simply the diameter of a hard sphere that diffuses at the same speed as the particle and molecule being measured. And this is going to be dependent on um, various things. Firstly, ionic strength. So ionic strength, um, that's going to influence the thickness of the cloud of ions that exists around the particles. Um, so those of you that have done any colloidal chemistry will know about um, something called the Debye length. The Debye length is the thickness of the electrical double layer, the cloud of ions that exists around the surface of the particle or the molecule. And that's inversely proportional to ionic strength. So as we increase ionic strength, we compress the Debye length. And therefore, the size we get from dynamic light scattering for any particle suspended in 
a salt solution is going to be smaller than the size we would get for the same particle if it was suspended in deionized water, for example. Uh, surface structure can influence hydrodynamic diameter because if we've got uh, let's say an adsorbed polymer layer on that surface, if the adsorbed polymer layer has a conformation in which the molecules are uh, sitting out into the medium, then that's going to influence the diffusion speed. And then we have shape. So if we have irregular shaped particles, um, as it undergoes random diffusion and during the course of a measurement, we are going to measure different diffusion coefficients depending on which orientation the particles are in. Remember that the size that we get from the technique is the diameter of a sphere which has the same average diffusion speed as the particle or the molecule being measured. So that's what's meant when we talk about hydrodynamic size. So what does a, a DLS instrument consist of? Well, I mentioned earlier that what we do is we take a suitable cuvette, which we've got here, we put our sample into that cuvette. The cuvette could be plastic disposable, it could be glass, it could be quartz. We, we've got low volumes cuvettes, for instance. Um, we can measure down as low as two microliters uh, in volume. We pass our laser into that sample, and the particles of the molecules in there will scatter light at all angles. Now, in this particular schematic, we are, we are detecting the light here at a 90-degree angle to the, the laser beam. For the majority of instruments that we currently sell, the vast majority uh, will measure at an angle of 173 degrees to the beam, and we call this um, backscatter detection. Now, the detector that we use is capable of counting individual photons. Uh, it's a photon counting device. The detector that we use is known as an avalanche photodiode, so it's very sensitive. And basically, what this detector uh, the signal it produces is simply the number of photons detected as a function of time. Now, you'll see in this little schematic here, the intensity is fluctuating over time. The important point to make is that the time scales uh, over which we're observing this scattering intensity are very rapid. We're talking nanosecond, microsecond, millisecond time scales. If we observed the intensity of a much longer time scale, seconds, tens of seconds, we wouldn't see these fluctuations. The intensity would be pretty much average. Um, so this signal is then passed into a digital signal processor. And um, the, the, the processor that we use is called a correlator. And you can see why some people know this technique as photon correlation spectroscopy because we are correlating the detected photons. I normally uh, represent the correlator as a dark gray box, as you can see, because for the majority of people that use dynamic line scattering instrumentation, they don't really understand what goes on in that correlator, but ultimately that's the heart of the instrument, the heart of the technique. So uh, it's important to try and have an appreciation of what correlation is. Now, if we were to look at the intensity fluctuations from um, a sample containing very small particles, nanoparticles, or molecular solutions, we would find the intensity fluctuates very rapidly. Conversely, if we've got much larger particles, hundreds of nanometers or microns in size, because their diffusion speed is much slower, the intensity fluctuates over much longer time scales. So the important message here is that the rate of fluctuation in the scattering intensity is determined by the size of the particles. And that's really the basis of the technique. Now the question is, well, why does the intensity fluctuate? So here's a schematic which tries to explain that. Let's imagine we've got two stationary particles and we pass a laser uh, across them they might scatter light, as you can see at the top of this slide, where we have got a maximum in one opposite a maximum in the other, or a minimum in one opposite a minimum in the other. Now, in that configuration, we have what is known as constructive interference. So when those scattered beams of light arrive on our detector, we get enhanced intensity. If, however, the position of one now moves with respect to the other, so we're now looking at the, um, the bottom half of the slide, we've now got a configuration where a maximum in one is opposite a minimum in the other, or conversely, a minimum in one is opposite a maximum in the other. And in this configuration, we have complete destructive interference. 
And when they arrive in our detector, the resultant intensity is now zero. Um, they effectively cancel each other out. Now, these are the two extremes that we could consider. We could have completely constructive interference or completely destructive interference. Now, when we take a measurement in a DLS instrument, we're not talking about two particles or two molecules which are stationary. We are measuring billions, and they are all undergoing random diffusion. So their position with respect to the detector is constantly changing. And as a result of that, we have an average intensity being detected. And that average intensity fluctuates over very short time scales. And that really is the basis now of the DLS technique. Now, we go on to talk about correlation, because that's all well and good. We, we can detect these um, fluctuating intensity signals. How do we analyze them? Well, we come to correlation, and what correlation is, is a technique for extracting the time dependence of a signal in the presence of noise. And this time analysis is what's carried out by the correlator. Now, there are not many equations um, in this presentation, but this one is fairly straightforward. What the correlator does is to construct the time autocorrelation function, uh, which is given a symbol of G. Um, of the scattered intensity. And this happens according to this equation. Now, when you look at this equation, what we have got here, so we are going to observe the scattering uh, intensity at time zero. We are then going to multiply it by the scattering intensity at time zero plus a delay time. And I'll mention what, the, the, what, what I mean by delay time shortly. And then we're going to divide it by the intensity at uh, time infinity squared. Now, time infinity sounds a very long way away, but in reality, we're talking a couple of seconds because the diffusion processes that we observe in dynamic light scattering occur over microseconds, millisecond time scales. So if we look at this signal over a couple of seconds in time, we are really at infinity. And so the correlator continuously does this process of multiplying um, numbers of photons together separated by a delay time. And the correlator has a number of delay times uh, associated with it. And these delay times start in the nanosecond time range. They go all the way through microsecond, millisecond, and up to seconds. So we are, we're basically covering about 11 decades of time um, in our correlator. To try and understand that, here's a schematic. So let's imagine this top trace is the intensity fluctuations that we've detected from a sample containing very small nanoparticles or a sample of, um, of molecules in solution, proteins or something like that. The intensity is fluctuating very rapidly. The bottom trace is from a sample containing much larger particles. So because the diffusion speed is much slower, the intensity fluctuates now over much longer time scales. So what we're now going to do is we're going to make copies of the signals, and we are going to place the copies on top of the original signals. And what we can say is, at time zero, the, the copy of the signal is absolutely identical to the original signal. So at time zero, the signal and the copy of the signal are perfectly correlated. Now, perfect correlation is given a value of one. And as you can see on this y-axis here, we've got a value of one up there. If there is no correlation in the signal, then obviously we've got a value of zero down here. Now, what you will notice is, in this case, we have an intercept which is not actually at a value of one. And I've deliberately done that simply because it's impossible as instrument manufacturers to develop an instrument which contains no noise. There is going to be noise within the system. What we try to do as the manufacturer is to minimize that noise as much as we can. And that comes down to the quality of the components that we use, the laser that we use, the detector that we use, the optical configuration, the optical components that we use. We're trying to minimize this noise as much as we can. Those of you that have got backscatter nanos, so nano S, nano ZS, nano ZSP, for instance, 
in backscatter, typically we would expect intercepts to be above 0.9. So if we express that as a percentage, that's 90% usable signal. That's pretty impressive. Um, Craig mentioned I started here in 1996. Well, if we were getting intercepts um, greater than about 0.4, they were amazing. I mean, today, if we had an intercept as low as that, we'd say there was a major problem. Um, so put this into context, we would expect very high intercepts now from the optical configuration that we're using. What we're now going to do is we're going to shift the signal with respect to when we started. So now we've introduced our first delay time in our correlator. Um, those of you that are nano users, the first delay time that we use in our correlator is 500 nanoseconds. Okay, so after 500 nanoseconds, in the top uh, signal here, because this is fluctuating very rapidly, there is a significant loss in correlation over that very short period of time. However, in the bottom signal, because that's taking much longer to fluctuate, yes, it's lost correlation, but it's lost correlation not to the same extent as the top one. If we now go on to the second delay time, and, and again, um, in the nano, the second delay time we use is 1,000 nanoseconds, which, which is one microsecond, we see that the correlation has decayed once more. Uh, in the top signal here, it's decayed much more rapidly than it has in the bottom signal. And again, just to reiterate, the reason for this more rapid loss in correlation in the upper signal is because the signal itself is changing more rapidly with time. Now, we can keep on doing this. So this, this is now what the loss of correlation looks like after the third delay time, until eventually we get to infinity. And at infinity, the signal bears no resemblance to when we started. So we've now reached a correlation coefficient here of one, uh, sorry, of zero. There's no more correlation left in the signal. Now, an important thing to say is, for any random signal, and of course this signal should be random if we're ob um, observing it from particles undergoing Brownian motion, there should be no um, ordered uh, processes going on in there. If it's a random signal, the loss of correlation is an exponential process. And what you can see there on the right-hand side of this slide, we have got these exponential decay rates uh, in correlation as a function of delay time. Now, you'll notice that currently, this x-axis has a linear uh, scale. Um, so we have a classic, what we would call a classic exponential decay curve. Now, if we plotted that exponential decay on a logarithmic x-axis, what we would see is what we get out of a measurement. So this fundamentally is what we get from a DLS measurement. We call this the correlation function or correlogram or autocorrelation function. And what we're observing here on the y-axis is the uh, correlation coefficient, the similarity of the signal with respect to itself, plotted as a function of delay time. And you can now see on this x-axis, we are covering a wide range of delay times. We're starting at 500 nanoseconds or half a microsecond, and we're going all the way up to a couple of seconds in delay time. In this upper signal, we can see that this loss in correlation is occurring over quite short delay times, uh, typically in this example, uh, over a few microseconds. In the bottom signal, however, the correlation persists for longer. And we don't really start to see a loss in correlation until we're up to a few hundred uh, microseconds in this example. 